Well, again, I want to add my welcome. So great to see you here back indoors. It's exciting. Um, we're not going to do some more baptisms. Oh, we might. If someone wants to get baptized, we could chat about that a little later. But this passage today really helps us to understand who we are and what we are like. Uh, we live in a world that says how we view ourselves matters. You know, sometimes we can have a too lower view of ourselves. And, and, and sort of self-doubt starts to creep in. We talk ourselves out of things. Uh, we don't look after ourselves. And it can be incredibly unhealthy to have too low a view of ourselves. Other times we can have too high a view of ourselves. Uh, place ourselves at the center of everything, become entitled, need to be caught up in the limelight all the time and this endless cycle of needing others to praise us and imposing our view on other people can be just as unhealthy. So how do we think about ourselves and our view of ourselves? Uh, the common answer to the question of how we view ourselves that the world gives really is the Goldilocks solution, generally. Right, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears and the three bowls of porridge. One, oh, that's too hot. The other one, oh, that's too cold. But there's this one in the middle. It's not too high, not too low. It's the just right view. <laughs> what I want to show you today as we come to God's Word is that if we hold a Goldilocks view of ourselves, while it makes sense on first impression, God says that's not true. And to hold that view is incredibly dangerous. Imagine for a moment that uh, you get to go to the doctor, you're just in for a checkup, life's going pretty well, you do your exercise, you're fairly fit and healthy, you eat a balanced meal, all those sorts of things. Uh, you go along thinking, look, I'm not the fittest person in the world, but I'm also not the most unhealthy either. I'm somewhere in this Goldilocks middle. And the doctor kind of does the full checkup, comes out and has a kind of concerned look on their face. He says, look, I've, I've got some bad news for you and I've got some good news for you. Now, if we're kind of thinking with our right minds, we want to hear both the good and the bad news. But imagine we just went for a moment, oh, you know what? There's good news and bad news. Don't worry about telling me what they are. They'll just balance them out in the middle. You know, the good and the bad, it'll be fine. I'll just keep moving. I don't need to know these bits of information. I'll just live in this Goldilocks zone where I think it'll all be great and I think I'm not too bad, not too light. <laughs> we could leave the doctor's surgery in dreamland, never knowing the reality of where we're at. And today, as we come to this part of God's Word, God is going to play the great physician on our hearts to show us the reality of where you and I are at, to see what our lives are actually like. And there's good news, and there's bad news. You want to take some notes? That'll be the structure of our talk. We'll look at the bad news first, then the good news, then what that means for us. Kind of simple structure as we move through. Let's start with the bad news. Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Paul says, in your natural state, me and you are dead. Dead. Yeah, probably sitting there going, you know, I don't, I don't feel dead. If I look around at these people, they're talking and walking. Um, you know, don't, don't feel dead in that sense. But Paul's claim is that they were dead. And when he talks about the you here, something interesting that goes on throughout the book of Ephesians. He's talking about both two groups of people. The you is the non-Jews. He talks about them as you, those who aren't Jews. You were dead. And all the Jews hearing this would have been like, yes, yes, those non-Jews, they were dead. Absolutely. Those who are gathered here in this Christian church that Paul is writing to, yes, you aren't Jews, of course, we know that. You're disgusting, vile people who are away from God, but God has now welcomed you in and you were dead. But Paul doesn't stop there. Verse 3, we all, he changes to the we and he's talking as a Jew. We all too previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, or literally children of wrath, as the others were also. Paul is saying Jew and Gentile. And if you're not aware of who that is, the non-Jew and the Jew, that's, that's the Bible's way of talking about the whole world. Literally here are together dead before God, spiritually dead. Now, again, we don't feel like we're dead. We don't feel like we were dead. We look at the world around us. Those people don't look dead, do they? And you're like, what is he talking about here? Well, it's Mother's Day today, and I hope for many of you, you've experienced the joy of flowers. You know, flowers brighten up the room or I show our love to someone else. Have you ever noticed that when you give flowers, you're giving people something that's dead? It's been cut off from its life source. Like, it's only going downhill. You're like, here's some flowers. Aren't they lovely? A day later, yeah, it's still all right. The good flowers, you might get three days, maybe four. And then they wilt and drop. And it's not like you did anything to them. They were given to us because their life source had been cut off. 
And they were dead at that point. And that is what Paul is saying we are like. We are spiritually dead in our natural state before God. Jew and Gentile, like all people, naturally before God, are dead. We've been cut off from the source of life. What's the source of life? It's, it's God. And the Bible here talks about the reality that caused us to be dead is this thing called sin. It's us turning our back on the, the source of all life, cutting off the source of life itself. Paul said in Romans 5 this, he said, Therefore, just as sin, rejection of God as, as, as God, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sinned. What Paul's saying is that naturally, we are not as good as we think we are. You are dead. Seriously, spiritually dead, deserving of God's judgment and wrath, and so am I. If you go back to Genesis, where we meet Adam and Eve, you hear the story in the Garden of Eden of God creating them and creating them in relationship for Him, with Him, and setting up the rules of the garden, saying you can eat from any of the trees, but from the tree of a knowledge of fruit, um, of good and evil, do not eat from that tree. And what happens is Adam and Eve kind of go along, and Eve's there, and she sees the tree. She's like, oh, it looks good. The serpent comes along and says, did God really say? And the ways of the world and, and Satan's lies come in. And she's like, oh, and she saw it became desirable for, for knowing good and evil. Now, what that word knowing there means is being intimately connected. In other words, determining good and evil. I could take this and I can be the ruler of my own life. I can stand like Leonardo DiCaprio in the front of the Titanic and I'm the king of the world. That's, that's what I can be like. It's so alluring, isn't it? to run our lives our way. Eve takes and eats, shares it with Adam who was with her and said nothing and didn't lead at all in that instance. And from that moment on, they're cut off from the source of life, like a beautiful rose snipped from its bush. And from that moment on, all of humanity is at war with God. See, from that moment on, everyone is, is born in, in rebellion against God because our parents are in rebellion against God. They've set up their own little kingdom, Adam and Eve, and then from everyone down. We're a child of someone who is at war with God. I think about it this way. If you were born in a family that was a terrorist family, the family are kind of against the establishment, that they're terrorists, you grow up just knowing the reality of the truth, that you don't like the established authority, you grow up as a terrorist, you're, you're a terrorist from that point on. That's just the reality because of who your parents are. And we experience that positively if you were born in New Zealand. If you were born in New Zealand, you didn't choose to be born here, you didn't do anything, but you get a whole heap of benefits. You get free education for a year, you get free health care, all these things that come because of nothing you chose to do if you're a citizen of New Zealand, but because your parents were born here. And if we're happy to take the positive of all the benefits the government will lay out to us because uh, we were citizens of New Zealand, then we've got to run with the negative of the fact that because our first parents were Adam and Eve, we're born at war with God. Sin is something that we are born into. It's a reality of what we're like. We are born dead, if you want. But it's something that we're also willingly complicit in, in that we do it. And Paul talks about it here as in our sins and trespasses. Now, sin is this overall condition, and trespasses are evidences of that condition. So let's say for a, for a moment, I start getting little red dots all over my body. You go, oh, the problem is the red dots on your body. Let's just get some makeup pen and, and make the, the red dots all disappear. Great, problem solved. No, I've, I've got an inner problem that's causing those red dots called chickenpox. And I need that to be solved before that solves the issue. So it is with sin. Sin is turning our back against God. And that evidences itself in, well, crossing the line. Trespasses is what the scriptures talk about. That we actually here cross the line all the time. I mean, can, can you... So I want you to seriously consider this next question, and a show of hands, if it's, if it's, who here has never, ever told a lie? Think carefully. I mean, you can make your first one now if you're going to put your hand up. <laughs> right? All of us, and we do it. We, we naturally do it. I didn't sit down with my kids at the dinner table when they were growing up and feeding them the food we were giving them and say, now, make sure when, when you grow up, you always get the biggest piece of cake. I didn't, I didn't teach them that. I, I didn't model that. It just They came out going, that I like, uh, I want to eat. And that's what we do. And as adults, we do the same thing, don't we? Just more politely. Oh, I like, I want to get it. How can I do it? And so I organize my life around putting myself at the center. We have in our DNA that we are naturally at war with God. That on our own, 
we are totally and utterly stuffed. Now, that's incredibly offensive to say that we're at that point because we, we don't like to think of that. We like to think, I've, I've got my life sorted pretty well. Paul here is not saying you're going to die. He's saying that in our natural state, apart from God, you and I are dead. Look around, friends, at us, at me, at the people that are here naturally, without any intervention from outside, we are dead spiritually. And death is the end if we continue rejecting God. And, and there's nothing that we can really do to solve the problem of us rejecting God. It's already happened. It's too late. We've, we've done the crime. Then we're going to need to pay the time. So Paul talks about us all naturally as children of wrath, children who <laughs> will inherit the reality of God's right anger and justice against us. In the Old Testament, God gave the prophet Ezekiel a picture of what this is like, of the spiritual state of the people of Israel. Uh, and if you've got a Bible there, open up to Ezekiel 37. Um, if the screen's working, it'll be on the screen. But I want us to read through and get this picture of, of, of what was set up, of what Israel were actually like. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and He brought me out by His Spirit and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Then He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel very wisely replied, Lord God, only you know. <laughs> you know well, I would say no normally, but you know, here he is. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God said to the bones. I will cause breath to enter you and, uh, and you will live. I will put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So in this vision, in this dream, he prophesied as he'd been commanded. And while prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and these bones came together, bone to bone. As I looked, tendons appeared on them, flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to, to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath, breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so they may live. So I prophesied, and as he commanded me, their breath Breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Amazing picture, isn't it? Then God explains to him what he's talking about in verse 11. He said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them, my people, and lead you into the land of Israel. You will know that I am the Lord, my people, and when I open your graves and bring up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. And then you will know that I am the Lord, that I have spoken, I will do it. This is the declaration of the Lord. He got a given a vivid picture of the spiritual state of Israel, of, of God's people and what they were like. And now Paul's saying, all the Jews knew the Gentiles were like that, but also so are the Jews. This is the reality of what we are like without God, cut off. Paul says, we walk according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the disobedient. We so often go with the flow of the world around us and listen really to what Satan is doing. And he is the ruler of the air at the moment. We go with the current, we, we go with the stream of the world around us and we give in and we make Satan our father. See, how can I illustrate this as vividly as I possibly can to recognize, you know, who we are and what we're like? And so I wanted to get a skeleton, a real one, and kind of show you and be like, well, that's a little bit gross. So what I did was, I thought about our rabbit that died recently. Yeah. See, what he's saying is, not that we're like a rubber glove. But we're dead like fish. <laughs> and I want us to get this vividly. Like, this absolutely stinks, okay? Now, I tried to get a full whole fish. Uh, this one's a little bit headless. It's had some uh, weight removal already happened. I couldn't get a whole one. But... Does anyone here think this fish can make itself come alive again? Anyone? How do you reckon this fish? Like, <laughs> sorry. Like, Paul's saying we are dead. 
But what I thought I'd do is I get some normal water. Who thinks when I put this in the water, it will swim in and of itself? What about swim against the current? Let's, let's give it a go. Yeah. Now, what I want to do is just leave that there for the rest of his talk. Oh, hang on. You too. Okay. Just to make sure you're whole. Just whole as you can be. Oh, that stinks. I want to leave that there as a reminder. We can watch to see if that fish will wake itself up. To see if a dead fish can do anything about its condition to come alive again. With little flippy flippers will flip. I touched it. (laughs) Friends, Paul's saying that is what we are like. Naturally, on our own, before God. That's offensive. Saying we are dead. And not just because of who our parents were, because they rebelled against God, because we turn our backs on the God who made us. We put ourselves on the throne. Now you can sit here today and we can sit here and go, oh, it's so strong, Rowan. Man, you're just, you're just trying to scare us into this reality. You can say that to the doctor when they say you have cancer as well. Oh, get away. You just want more money. You love cutting people up, you surgeons. You're just making up the cancer that's there. Or we can listen to the diagnostic. The diagnostic that says, if you pitch yourself as that you are too high, your view of yourself, then you'll miss the reality of where you're really at. And it's devastating. Hebrews 9.27 says, man is destined to die once. We've been cut off. And then we will die. And after that, face judgment. We can't reach out to God. We can't do anything to make ourselves alive. As you look around the room, Christians have no um, leg to stand on to say, I'm better than you because we're, we're all dead. Every work we've done puts us in a horrible state toward God because we've rejected Him. Well, that's the bad news. But here comes the good news. The bad news showed us how dark a position that each and every one of us is in without God. But the good news is God didn't leave us to die. In case you're wondering, I've got no amazing tricks to make that come to life. I'm not God. So don't sit there and think, how's He going to do it? I'm not. Look at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, in not giving us what we do deserve, because of His great love that He had for us, made us, He's talking to the Christians, those who have trusted in Jesus, made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses, Jew and Gentile together, you were dead. You were saved by grace, which just means an undeserved gift. Some of us come along and we think too highly of ourselves. We think, you know what, I'm a pretty good person. I'm okay with God. I've done good things. I've, I've, I've lived a good way. I, you know, I haven't killed anyone. Um, and some of us kind of think, we'll just fake it till we'll make it. We'll come on, we'll put a good face on. But people know what, God knows what goes on behind closed doors. We need to be brought down, but not to stay down. Others of us here might think too lowly of ourselves, think the wrong that we have done before God is, is too much for Him. That we are just so dead that there is nothing God can do. He can't reach into the depths of I am. I'm deader than dead than dead than that fish is dead deadness. We get caught in a cycle of going over and over what we've done in the past, what we do in the present. I think we're, we're too far from God. But I want to put it to you, that's actually another form of thinking too highly of ourselves. To think that I could be so far from God that even God couldn't reach down and get me. Really? The one who spoke and creation came into being. The one who made the dead alive. If that's you, you need to have a good, long, hard look at yourself and ask yourself in the mirror. If I think I'm too far gone for God, who do you think you are? That your sin can be beyond what the God of the universe can do. Because what, what Paul says is that God has shown mercy. He has not given us what we do deserve. He's not given us what, what we've asked for by wanting nothing to do with Him and no life. He has reached out when we were dead, like this. None of us could do nothing ourselves. Fish hasn't moved. I don't want to touch it because I'm... To make us come alive, the fish can't do anything. Like, I've, I've never heard of a dead person who's been lying there and reaching out and grabbing the defibrillator and going, oh, hang on, and putting it on and doing it themselves. There's nothing they could do. And actually, a defibrillator only works if your heart's still got an irregular rhythm. If it's dead, dead, and it ain't going to do nothing. <laughs> While we were dead, 
the God of the universe that we rejected, that we wanted nothing to do with, that we wanted to take the place of, whether we did it politely or arrogantly, reached out and said, I'm going to make you alive. He breathed life into us. Not because um, you or I or Jew or Gentile were any less dead. He didn't look around and go, oh, that one down there is pretty good. I've got a bit to start with there. I might go over here to this person. It's not too bad. And look at the dead fish one and go, that one hasn't got a head. That's going to be even harder to do. No, no, no. There was nothing in and of ourselves that we had. No goodness, no propensity to even be able to be one of God's people. God reached out and made us, those who are gathered in this, to this letter that it's written to, those who are trusting in Jesus now, made us alive, that life could be ours. Why did He do it? Our immediate reaction is, well, because I'm so good, <laughs> you know? Because I'm worthy of God's saving. He looks at me and is like, I made them. I kind of want to, yeah, I should make them a bit better. No, nothing to do with you or I. We were like, this is really starting to smell. It's also smoked, but anyway. Um, and, and we were even smellier than that. <laughs> Ephesians 3.10, this is what Paul says. This happened so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the, through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. God made us alive so that these rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, in the spiritual realm, there's more than just us, it's more than just about us, that they might go, whoa, God, you are amazing. You took an ugly, dead sinner like Rowan and brought him to life? Like, that's amazing. It's not that, you know, he took people that were kind of good or had something to offer at all. He took people that had no hope and made them winners. It's like, it's like the Warriors winning the premiership, right? It's never happened. It's probably never going to happen. <laughs> but you got the Warriors to win the premiership? What an amazing coach that would take. <laughs> There's no room for arrogance, no room for my efforts, no room for my work. Because Paul said we were dead. The best news of the passage is that my life, my salvation, my forgiveness, my relationship with God, the things that I cut off by rebelling against God, the things that Adam cut off by him rebelling against God, and that flowing through to me, that my life has been given back to me because of everything that God did and nothing I did. But God. God loved us because He loved us because He loved us. And that concept is so foreign to us today. Even in the ancient times, you don't really find it anywhere else in the universe that someone loves something because uh, just nothing to do with it. We generally love things or people because of their intrin intrinsic qualities, something that we like about them. Over the last uh, few months, uh, our pet rabbit died a number of months ago, which was sad, but we've been talking as a family, is it time to get a dog? Uh, and we've been um, encouraged um, hassled, I don't know what else you'd say, maybe like a terrorist attack from our children, uh, to say, we need to get a dog. We'd love to get a dog. And so we've been thinking through this, and on our day off on Thursday, we, uh, we went to the dog breeders to have a look at some puppies. And actually, we, we got to choose a puppy. There were three that we were particularly choosing between. And you look at them, I was going to show you a picture, but I didn't get it in time. You look at them, and you're like, oh, they're so cute, right? They're so great and so lovable. And we're picky, I'm like, oh, I think I like this one because its patterns are a bit better than that one. I'm like, man, imagine if we, the way we selected dogs, we selected humans. You're like, well, it feels really shallow, Rowan. What's the character like? And so I'm trying to think through what are they like as this puppy. And I, anyway, we picked out one that we, we've said, yep, we put a deposit down that we're going to get this puppy when it's old enough. It's only six weeks at the moment. And at that moment, we're choosing this, this dog because of, well, its intrinsic qualities. I looked at the mother and the father and what they were like. I kind of saw the way they acted, were they well-behaved, obedient, healthy, all those sorts of things. I kind of, we do this all the time because our choices are based on the qualities of the thing that we are choosing. God does not do that. He doesn't look at us and go, oh, so cute. He's like, disgusting, smelly, wet fish. Hasn't swum yet. Now I'm worried about putting it back in. Oh, sorry, guys. Oh, look at that. That's going to freak some people out, isn't it? Sorry. You okay? Oh, I touched it now. Yeah. 
God's love for us has nothing to do with how good we are. Each and every one of us deserve God's wrath, separation from His goodness forever. We've rejected the God who gives life. That's what we deserve. God shows us, not because He wants to go, wow, look at these people, not because He even just wants us to be in right relationship with Him, although that's true, but there's something else going on. Romans 9, Paul explains it a little more. Romans 9, verse 9. It is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of promise are considered to be the offspring. In other words, the ones that will inherit God's blessing. Rebecca conceived children through one man. Romans 9, verse 10. Our father Isaac. For, through, for though her sons had not been born yet, or done anything good or bad, right? They had not transgressed. They had not, there had been, there'd been no transgressions. There are twins in, in, in the womb of Rebecca. For though her sons had not been born yet, or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election, according to his choice, might stand, not from works, but as the one who calls, Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, I have hated Esau. Now, I hear that and I'm like, whoa, how, how could God like, look down on those puppies and go, well, I, I'm going to love that one, I'm going to hate that one. How is that kind of fair? How is that kind of right? It feels like God is kind of harsh at this point, but remember... Every single one of us deserves to be cut off from God and are cut off from God because that's what we've asked for. If we want God to be fair, we want Him to send us all to hell to to do exactly what we've done, to make ourselves king and be in separation from His goodness forever. That is what's fair. Jacob and Esau were the demonstration of God's choice, God's work for His purposes. He was showing the world that it's about his choice, that he chooses who he wants to choose, not because of anything to do with them. Literally, they're done neither good nor bad. He was showing that he chooses, that the older would serve the younger because God made a choice that had nothing to do with them. Jacob was saved by grace, by God's complete goodness. One way to look at the whole storyline of the Bible is to think that it's about God bringing us as His people back into relationship with Himself, that that's the greatest good, to see people trusting God again and in right relationship. And there's very much truth to that. As you look through the Scriptures, you see that over and over again. Uh, And we can sometimes think that if God chooses some and not others, what's He doing in that point? Is that fair? I mean, Romans 1 does tell us that God has made Himself known clearly. His eternal power and divine nature can be clearly seen from what has been made, rendering none of us without excuse. So so there's enough information to come to God, but none of us do. But then God chooses out of His great mercy, giving us what we don't deserve because of His grace and love to choose some. And that's because the Bible is not primarily about you or I getting back into relationship with God. It's about God being glorified. It's about the world seeing how amazing He is because that is for our good. Oh, there's about relationship with Him and and our love for Him and Him loving us, but it's about showing the rulers and the authorities the reality that God is God over all and will be God over all forever. The Bible is primarily about God's glory. In a sense, that that makes me cringe again. I'm like, oh, feels a little arrogant. Maybe God thinks of Himself too highly in this. But it'd be like the... The earth saying to the sun, I'm sick of, you know, the sun, me orbiting around the sun. I want the sun to go around me for a while. You know, I'm just saying, the sun's so self-focused and arrogant. But it can't be any other way. The gravitational pull of the sun is so huge that, of course, the earth goes around. So the physics of God, the gravitational pull of the reality that He made the universe and is in control of the universe means He is deserving of glory. And any moment we step in and think, it should be more about me, ah, just shows that we're just like our first parent, Adam, doesn't it? It's ridiculous. Now, some of us here might be thinking, well, then what if God doesn't choose me? That's never a question the Bible raises. There's never a problem for the New Testament authors. They keep proclaiming the news of God's love shown at the cross and calling people to come and trust Jesus. But the reality they also keep saying is when you come and do trust Jesus, you know you can only do that because God spoke and brought you back from life. Dead fish can't speak. Dead fish can't live. If you're here today and you're not yet someone who trusts Jesus, who's given your life to Him, I want to encourage you, come and trust Him today. 
Come and accept what He's done for you. Allow Him to make you alive. But when you do that, if you do that, you'll realize that it was Him bringing you to yourself. Him bringing you to Himself. But the good news doesn't stop there. Not only did He save us, not only did He make us alive, but verse 6, look at this really carefully. He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him, with Christ, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. God lavishes His loves on those who are dead. It's probably one of the most amazing things in the universe, right? The temptation is to just see ourselves now as sinners rolling around in our sin and struggling through life, doing what we don't want to do, not doing what we do want to do. But God takes our pictures out of this world and says, if you trust in Jesus, if God has brought you from death to life, then you are seated in the heavenly realms. Not in heaven, the new creation will be on earth if Jesus comes back. But where Christ is seated now bodily, you are seated spiritually. Imagine this for a moment. Picture a massive table, huge, that goes on for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. And at the head of the table is Jesus in his full glory. And as you kind of look, you see him. And then as the camera pans back, you see those who are, who are, who are still alive on earth, but they are seated in the heavenly realms so securely at the table of Jesus. He has them. He has them there eating. And as the camera pans back further and further and further, you trust in Jesus. You see you seated in the heavenly realms right now. Paul is saying that's the reality. The problem isn't necessarily that we, we think too highly of ourselves. We don't think highly enough of where we are now seated because of what God has done for us. If you trust in Jesus, you are seated in the heavenly realms right now. We spend so much time making our houses look good, our resumes look good and polished up, our reputation, our works to say, look at me, look at what I'm doing, look at what I've achieved, look at what I can do when right now we are seated in the heavenly realms at the table with Jesus. Why do I spend so much time trying to craft a good picture of myself here when that's the reality that's on view? You are seated if you trust in Jesus, with Christ, secure, planted. And it had nothing, zip, diddly squat to do with you or what you or I have done. It had everything to do with the God who reached out and made us alive and breathed life into us. How amazing is God's grace? It's no wonder that when the slave traders realized the reality of what they were doing and they saw what God had done as Christians, that John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. He recognized how wretched he was and you and I had no different. There are no levels at the foot of the cross. We were all beggars pointing at other beggars to where the bread is. We, we can't look around and go, I'm so much better than that person over there. Or, I've, I've got life so much more together or even just a little bit. You know, I can't believe they sinned. Oh, look in the mirror, Rowan. Look at the way you think and act. Why does God tell us what's going on in the heavenly realms? He didn't need to. I think it's firstly because we can so easily miss the grandeur of what's already happened for those who trust in Jesus. We are seated with Christ. But it's also so that we don't rob God of the very purpose Jesus died. Why did Jesus die? It wasn't for us primarily. Verse 7, look carefully. So that in the coming ages, He might display the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. He did it to show the rulers and authorities, look what I did with them and I kept them and I lavished my love on them. The moment that we claim that we had anything to do with our salvation, we rob God of His glory of His display, of His immeasurable kindness, of His, his grace becomes not as profound because they were pretty good people. You know, I did some good stuff. I was kind of helpful in the way we did this. He did reach out a little from the, the, the death while He was dead, kind of had a little finger twitch. Maybe that was enough. And God gets less glory because, no, it was totally and utterly God. He didn't choose the best ones. He didn't have a good starting point. God shows us where we are seated and our purpose in His cosmic plan so we won't think it's about us. What we will see is that we now have great freedom because it's about God. And God is about His glory to the end. And He will glorify Himself by holding us to the end. By bringing those who've come from death to life and holding us in death to life. It doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on our comfort. It doesn't depend on what I do or I've done. It's all done in Christ if you trust in Him. Life is so full of doing, isn't it? Always got to do stuff. Got to cut the grass, got to do this application form, got to 
do what the boss wants or the shareholder wants or keep a staff member happy or keep uh, the, the lecturers happy or the students happy or the family happy or the kids happy. I've got to do this stuff for my spouse and my friends. And my, we're always about doing. Everything we do is based on our performance. <laughs> By the way, so is hell because that's what we did. <laughs> We rejected God, and that is based on our performance. We have qualified ourselves beautifully for God's wrath. But along comes God, Jesus dying in our place while we were still sinners. And God the Son says three words, it is finished. It's finished. He lived the perfect life. He died in our place. He offered us His. He's forgiven us. So Paul says in verse 8, for you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. So even the faith I have is part of the gift of God. It could be the faith or, or the faithfulness of Jesus, or just faith in Jesus, but the whole picture of salvation is what's on view, that God has given us. We could do nothing. And what that means is that we cannot boast. It also means... There is not one person in this room that you or I can look down on and say, I can't believe you did that. Not one. There is not one person in this room that can look down on us and go, I can't believe you are so bad, so much worse than me. We need to see how flat the foot of the cross is. There is no room to look at anyone else and go, ah, what a shocker. Yes, we're all shockers. Me too. I am no better than anyone else. So often I find myself frustrated with people, with myself, with my family, with, with others, of, of how people behave, of what they say. And I get this growing sense of self-righteousness. I'm glad I'm not like them. Is that just me? Or do you find it too? I don't sin like they do. I don't do things as badly as they did. That's much worse than what I did. And right there I rob God of His glory. I say, I'm just a little bit closer to God. He didn't need as much kindness with me as he needed with them. Those people were extra grace required. <laughs> Don't believe that lie. I heard the story of um, a convicted criminal who went to church. Uh, he, he'd done his time, I think it was for murder, a true story in the UK, and went up to take the Lord's Supper up the front. Uh, and as he knelt down, in the same church, would you have it, was the judge who put him away. And at the front knelt down was this convicted criminal who'd done his time in jail and was out, repentant, at, at the Lord's Supper, taking the Lord's Supper, alongside the judge who put him in jail. And after the service, the minister came up to the judge and said, wow, isn't that amazing? How did you feel knowing who was standing next to you? He's like, I know. He said, I'm just amazed at the miraculous grace of God, at what he's done for me. So the judge got it. He was no different from the criminal. He was in exactly the same spot. And so are we before God. The incredible implications of this for us is there's no one-upmanship, no comparison, that we're now free to say sorry because my salvation doesn't depend on what I do. I can own my sin. I can own my failings. I'm, I'm free to forgive, knowing that other people are just as sinful as me. I've got no horse to stand on to say, that. look at me, I'm, I'm on my high horse. If right now you're failing to forgive someone, if you're going, I will not forgive them, then as hard as it is, you're not understanding what Christ has done for you. I know it's not easy. And sometimes the hurt runs so, so deep and it takes time. Don't say, oh, it just should happen. Yep, we all move on. No. But freedom comes from looking that I am like that dead fish. And I've been brought from that by Christ for nothing that I have done. That frees me to enjoy the great freedom of being able to forgive others. Let me ask you today, who do you need to go and forgive and say, I forgive you? Release them from it because you're no different from them. You've done nothing <laughs> that, that, that has, isn't just as bad, if not worse, of what they have done. Where do you need to look to the picture of where you are now seated at the foot of the cross of what Jesus has done? Where you can entrust right judgment to God where you have been forgiven. Or maybe for you today, it's going to say sorry, recognizing that we've been full of pride in certain areas. Oh, we may have acted in the right way, but man, we've held on to our pride and thought that we are better and actually going to that person and apologizing. 
letting go of how they hurt you and considering how you may have hurt them, experiencing the freedom that comes from that. We've seen the bad news and the good news. There's one last very short point that is incredible. And that's what that means for us now. See, the the foot of the ground of the cross is incredibly flat, which gives us great freedom. Look at how Paul ends the section, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. I'm I'm, I'm dead in my sins. God God has raised me to life. He's, He's given his breath into me. And then he says, you can't boast in any of this. This is all me. And I've done that. I've freed you from all this. I've loved you because I love you because I love you so that you might freely live for me. Not in order to earn it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. It's literally poetry, the word that talks about good works there. It's this where we get the idea of poetry from. You are God's poetry to live out in his world, to show the rulers and the authorities and the rest of the world and Satan, man, God is good. He used people like them, <laughs> which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We have been free from having to work, so we might be free to work for him to live for Him. So, so we might not try and boast in ourselves or earn what we've done or be good people, or, or, but live as people who were once dead who've now been alive. Imagine that. Imagine you went to your workplace this week with that reminder that I was dead and Jesus made me alive. And how are you going to, what values are you going to put first when people go, oh, I'm not going to give you that promotion. Man, I'm in Christ. Okay, that's a bit frustrating, but whatever. <laughs> Have you seen Him? Or when someone cuts us off in traffic and we're so self-righteous, I never do that, get out of the way. You're like, you idiot, Rowan. No, I can pray for them. Or or you have the opportunity to talk to someone about Jesus or someone says something horrible to us and we're like, how dare they say that? Uh, And and when we worry about what, what people will think of us as Christians. This is written in the first century when Christians are being put on lampposts for standing up for Jesus. As I look at what God has done for me, It excites me that I get to be involved in His work, to glorify Him, to live for Him with the skills and gifts and ability He's given me. The poetry of God is to use you and I in all our brokenness, in our weakness, in the ways that we don't have life together, to actually take those moments of weakness and not be like, look, I've got it together, everyone. The world does not need a bunch of people saying, look how close together and close to you we are to point to God's glory. They need people to go, look how broken I am. I naturally keep stumbling, I keep falling, but I have a God who loves me and died for me and rose again and my future is secure. Do you see the freedom that comes from that? What can be taken from me? Nothing. Let me ask you today. Have you for too long been standing on the sidelines of God's glory? thinking, oh, that's for them, that's for others, that's for those people who are really passionate for Jesus, the ones who are kind of really out there. They should be the ones who are serving God. And I'll just stand back and on the sidelines of God's glory. (laughs) Rather than recognizing He's made you and I exactly the way He wants to bring about His glory. What's holding you back from sharing the ugly truth of what you are like, of what we're like, and how God has called us from darkness into light? Our world doesn't need a bunch of people pretending they have no need for God. Our world needs a bunch of people who are convinced that He is our only hope and that we live our lives pointing to Him. That makes Him look good. Friends, our sin is darker than we could ever imagine. Our God is more merciful and more loving than we could ever dream of. So don't sell yourself short in the glorious freedom of working for God, for His glory, for who He has made you be, so that you might live for His glory and He be glorified on this earth. Let's pray. Father God, we confess that so often we think too highly of ourselves. We look in the mirror and though we know our failings, we... We think we can do better. We think we can be better. We are so thankful (laughs) that you've come to us as we are. Would you please show us where we need to repent, to turn back from our ways of pretending to be you, pretending we can be good enough for you and recognize the amazing, amazing grace, mercy and love you've shown us because of nothing we've done. 
You have made us alive. For those here today that do not yet know you, that have not yet put their trust in you, Lord, may you draw them to yourself. Might today be the day that, that we say, yes, I want to enjoy God's love forever. I want to enjoy the forgiveness that comes, the freedom that comes in that. And Father God, as we think about the way you've made us and our failings and our stumblings, we ask that you'd work in each one of us to use who you've made us for your glory, to not stand on the sidelines of your glory, but to be involved, to use all we have so that the world around might see both in our, in our strengths and in our weaknesses that you are using them for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen.